resilience engineering. Uh, however, I want to get you into that through building quality, because for some of you, if you attended any safe training, they will speak about um, this topic highly, saying um, building quality, and they mention Chaos Engineering, Chaos Monkey, when we speak about certain part of it. So really, I want to link all those together and show you how all this play together. So I'll be speaking about a bit of introduction. Then we're going to speak about the level of testing, and then we're going to speak about the different form of testing. And then I'll open it up for question and answer. Um, anyone guess why we test in the first place? Why eventually we test? Well, I think if, it, if I would like to start, I think we test because nothing is perfect. We always exactly. find it. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a human error. So, and this is why I, I made the title as a uh, human uh, kind of uh, uh, where the, the human error nature in, in, in all the discussion that we are having. Um, and another perspective of that is really that concept of availability, of being able to, to present on the best way. Uh, part of that is the theory of the nines. Anyone know that? So when we speak about 99% uh, availability, we're almost being about 3.5 days off in a year. When we speak about 99.9, .9, that's eight hours down. When we speak about 99.99, we speak about 53 minutes. Now, let's think about it. If you are on, uh, on streaming service, whether that Netflix, whether that Amazon, whether that Apple or any other provider, which one of those you would like to see? Which one of those do you, do you want your service to be in? Uh, I think the most stable one I, or the most resilient. So which service are we getting? Now, if you're watching Netflix, if you are live, if you are streaming, what level of service are you seeing? Are you seeing even the 99 point that gazillion nines in it. We're trying to have a service with least disruption. And this is really the purpose of the testing that we are doing in everything we do today. We are looking at availability above 100%. We want a response time simultaneously. So let's take that and let me speak quickly about the concepts of um, built-in quality. And I want to speak about building quality, how building quality work. And of course, everything is driven from XP practices. So we all, most of us are um, uh, safe gurus. We, at least we got one training in there. So we already know that building quality is one of the core value of safe. Um, we demonstrate quality in different way, we look at ensuring quality apply everywhere. Now, to build in quality, quality is first and foremost is a function of, of culture. We cannot just decide to add some quality into, into the mix. It needs to build in. And there's different practices. Scrum XP is a lightweight process to deliver value for cross-functional self-organizing team we then save it combined the power of Scrum project management practice with extreme programming XP practices. Um, and, and this is some of the practices that we want we already familiar with. And I don't want to drill down on those. There's CDD, there's BDD, and I'll, I'll come to those in a minute. But those in a nutshell, what we know about building quality. Now, there's different form of testing. So there is test-driven development, which um, we speak about shift everything 
um, earlier, so we can start with the testing. And this has been there for a long time. We design like how we design our quality in. And here, when we speak about that, that's the simple form of testing. Uh, we are testing a context. We are adding component or entity to that. We are writing a new testing, a new story, a new component, and we test it in different ways. And BDD, when trial, its customer, developer, and tester create the scenario for external behavior of the system, what, um, what our customer wants. TDD is development phase where we create tests before the code and each part of the code have tests and check. A test in a small unit for each part of the code. If we work on a um, routing break, if down into section, but what if we have kind of original and destination um, are equal, uh, which result uh, it's it's valid. Which result we can we can validate in there? So this is where we speak about test should fail the first time when we write it. If not fail, mean um, whether we implemented or this test is not testing anything in the first place. So once it failed, we write enough code to make it pass this test, and and we'll check to make sure that all tests pass refactoring the code for simplicity and making sure all tests pass and we are not breaking anything. So again, technical agility is a critical for, for team operating which and uh, within an agile restraint and it removes a great deal of waste, uncertainty, delay and fiction for um, those cross team collaboration. and. Um, we already know how to convert uh, uh, the, uh, the Greek kind of methodology of, of converting the acceptance criteria into test by applying scenario. Um, and the purpose of everything we speak is really shifting things more um, to, to left. So when we start, the feature, we write the test. When we start the story, we write the test. When we start the code, we write the test. Um, and this is not only kind of collapsing the V, it's also bringing down um, what we are discussing about, um, about the concept of building quality rather than adding a layer of quality. So, and here, if, we, if we're gonna speak about um, Testing. So here I want to focus on one thing, which really the big topic I want to discuss, which is none and um, unknown form of testing. So there's different levels of testing, testing that done by developer, developer with the tester, by testers themselves and the end user. And we know that when we go up in this pyramid, we are increasing cost and it's more difficult because if we test only from the UI, that's more expensive and the cycle of testing more. So really the myth, the, the merit here is to do more testing on the unit uh, um, and growing that because this is faster, this is save us money more. Um, this is make um, uh, saving even in dollar amount for us. So this is something um, we always wanted, we always want to have. Um, we don't want to reverse that because this is really what the traditional model is. Everyone's familiar with the continuous code integration. In order to enable that building quality, what we want really is build that continuous uh, code integration. So when the developer commit the code, uh, the build is generated, auto tests happen, version control update, um, we prepare the app package, we test the pack, uh, app package, and we deploy it to, to staging or to production using that um, ability to hide our uh, changes from production if we choose to, um, until it's stabilized. And this is all facilitated by avoiding physical branch and having more software and forcing team to integrate with each other more. 
We spoke about um, system demo and how system demo helped in that. Um, so everything I spoke about is really none. This is one of the form of testing that we have an input, we are expecting output. So the answer to, to those tests is really none. Um, if we're speaking about unit tests, if we're speaking about integration tests, that's all we know the results. We are expecting something to show. When, when something didn't show, um, that's, that test is, um, did not pass. Now, let's look back at what we are dealing with today. When we are in the cloud, when we have connected services, um, everything we do, are we really able to, to perform that? Are we able to apply that on everything we do? We are, if this is true, then why in, in, in all cases, we always have surprises, we always have down. Even the, bigger, the biggest cloud provider, they have downtime. If they are testing well, why does this happen? Why always we have an issue in, in production or in some environment? So let's here look at what form of unknown driven testing that we want to look at. And in order to speak about that, I'm going to take you to a totally different domain, just off topic. So how firefighter are trained or and how much training does firefighter get? Anyone can guess? So fire, so those highly trained firefighters uh, specialize in risking their life every day to fighting fires. And they, they do that in order to become active duty firefighter, um, each one of them have approximately had 600 hours in training. And that's just the beginning. After that, some firefighter, according to some reports, spend 80% of their active duty time in training. So why? Why do they do that? What reason could be behind that? When a firefighter goes under life fire condition, she or he need to have an intuition for the fire they are fighting against. To acquire that life um, saving intuition, she or he need to train hours after hour after hour, like the old um, age saying, practice make it perfect. So, uh, and this is a real image from um, fighting wildfire um, with computer and intuition. So they seem to get inside the head of the fire, sort of like Dr. Phil of a fire. Um, I don't know if this is a good example or not. So the, the real statement from fire chief is you don't choose the moment, the moment choose you. You only choose how prepared you are when it does. And this is exactly what happened in our systems. This is exactly what we're speaking about. If you look at this picture, what could possibly go wrong? Does that represent anything in, in our data center, in our cloud hosting? We don't know. Let's let's see. So um, let's go back and speak about a little bit history. Um, Jess Robbins in 2000, um, he's a retired firefighter. He joined Amazon and his title was um, uh, Master of Disaster. And he planned what he called a game day where um, he designed a test to train and prepare all Amazon system and software and people to respond in disaster um, mode. So what exactly he did? So just like a firefighter, just as he get that training um, to build that intuition to, to fight lives for uh, life fires, um, what he did is uh, help, help his team build uh, intuition 
against life, large scale, uh, catastrophic failure in different aspects. And how he did that? He did that really by chaos engineering. So what exactly he did is experiment because um, we have unknown. So what he did exactly that day in maybe more than 21 years ago, kind of sparkled the start of everything because Amazon have that big, huge hierarchical system, complex system of streaming, of um, online uh, retail, of also logistics. What he wanna test is what happened if one component of the system happened. Remember 2000, 2000, cloud wasn't that big thing to speak about or wasn't there at all. We think that virtualization is the next big thing. And guess what would happen? So imagine that, uh, and I think this is, at least this is how I felt it in 2000, where we're getting a new service, we just plug it in and we just throw it and it works with the rest of the component that we have. Does that make sense? Does that true? We don't know. So what he want to do, what happened if part of the service that you're relying on um, break down, how your system behaves? Did we test that? We never, we tested a component, but we never tested the end-to-end -end service that our customers see. And this is really driven from delivery of value that we speak. So, and this is the core idea of course or resilience engineering. It's the art of breaking things purposefully uh, and peacefully, I would say. So um, it's based on experience because we have unknown. Our thoughts always that um, we are resilient. We, we will provide our fallback plan. We have our HR, uh, we have our high availability, we have our disaster recovery. Um, but guess what happened when there's disaster? How long it takes you to be uh, online again? I'll take you at the end because many people join to, to the nine puzzle that we started with. So um, you'll need to have confidence in the quality of your application to use chaos engineering. If you have a crappy code or any crap in your system, in your code, in your hardware, you need to fix it before you go to this step because that could be really bad. So you need an extra step of experiment to prove that your application itself is ready to go through that resilience testing. So although chaos engineering is often executed in production, this is probably not the place to start with. If you want to do that first experiment, it might be possible to do it in um, an acceptance testing environment, uh, depending on, on the experiment that you wanna have and what scale you're gonna take it to. So as you get confident over time or um, want to test uh, larger parts of your application landscape, maybe in production, that one you want to scale it up, but be ready. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just setting the stage here to, to what we're going to speak about, because we want to emulate a fully disrupted application landscape in um, a test or acceptance environment before we go. So this work, um, this work well in the cloud environment, any cloud environment where you have control over the infrastructure and it is possible to create an infrastructure on which to execute your experiment, which um, experiment takes place. So if you can redirect a small number of user or specific users, maybe, maybe employee or beta users or um, a test uh, client, to this experiment infrastructure, you can run the experiment there without exposing your entire population to the risk of that experiment. And it's a risky experiment. So there's five phases to perform a chaos engineering. And just to give you an idea, chaos engineering, I'm gonna explain in more details in the next slide, but chaos engineering is really looking at how your application will behave in a disaster, in a real disaster. Um, 
And it's designed for the cloud because your application, what you are building in the cloud is different from the application we built it in the 70s, even in 2000, 21 years ago. So you need to have a different method of testing. And this is really the message that we want to speak about um, more than anything. So we're going to have five phases of cost engineering. We need a steady state. We, we have a hypothesis. We design the experiment. We learning and results. And then we do fixes. So uh, the five, those are really the five phases of cost. And I want to focus on, on the first two. So creating hypothesis, you have an idea of what can go wrong. You have chosen the exact failure to inject because what we're doing is injecting failure. And we're gonna see how we're gonna do that. And you would have an expectation how this um, uh, failure behave, but what happened next? This is an excellent, um, thought exercise to work through as a team. By discussing the scenario, you can put hypothesis in place on what's the expected outcome before running this live. And what will be the impact on our customer to your service or your um, dependents, whoever they are. So set that expectation with your team. So you get your defined kind of normal ready you sit with your team, you put a list. Okay, if we take this service out, if we, if we slow down the service, what's gonna happen? Document those hypotheses because you're gonna use it again to compare to what's gonna happen. Then you wanna design that experiment and you wanna measure the impact on that. So to understand how your system behave under stress, you need to measure your system's availability and durability. So it's a good to have a key performance metric that correlate to customer success. As a rule of thumb, if you, uh, if you ever see an impact on these metrics, you want to halt the experience immediately. Next is measuring the failure itself, where you want to verify or disprove your hypothesis. So this could be the impact on latency request uh, per second uh, or system resources. And lastly, you want to survey your dashboard um, and alarm uh, for unintended side effects. Even when listening to the masters of this, of, of this type of testing, they always tell you it gets out of control. So look at this from different perspective. And here, just to summarize, when we're designing the experiment, we are picking one and only one metrics, and we're monitoring this metrics. If you are a service provider, this is maybe your ability to stream. This is maybe the customer ability to make a transaction, uh, to purchase something, regardless if the UI look funny or not, but this is, will be your metrics. And this is what you're going to be measuring going forward. And only one metrics at, at the time. I'll give you some example toward the end. So, um, uh, so then the next steps is really having a rollback plan. Always have a backup plan in case things go wrong, but accept that sometimes even backup plan can fail. Look through how you're going to, to revert the impact. If you're running command by hand, be through thoughtful not to break SSH or any control um, that plane access um, to, to your instance and then go fix it. Um, and by going fixing is really, after you run your experience, you hopefully there is one of the outcome. Either you verify that your system is bulletproof and resistant, or you have found a problem that you need to fix it. In both, these are a good outcome. On one hand, you've increased your confidence in the system uh, and its behavior. And on the other hand, you found a problem before it causes an outage. And then 
the last thing is have fun. Chaos engineering is a tool to make your job easier by proactive, um, proactively testing and validating your system failures, um, the modes that you will reduce your operational burden, increasing your availability and sleep better at night. So um, make it safe and simple to get started. Um, so let's, so those are the steps, the five steps. Now let me take you through um, a little bit more example. So if we look at this as a service, what we are having is incoming traffic and that, that goes to the service. So if I'm a mobile uh, streaming provider, I have incoming traffic that requests a play for uh, or streaming service to certain items. Um, if I'm um, maybe um, Amazon of the world, I'm selling the customer are, uh, have a request, they submit it, they purchase the item, the item is confirmed, they can ship it. Um, if I'm uh, Netflix, my service is you click play button, the videos play. So look at all those examples, I'm taking a simple linear process. I'm not taking in consideration anything else. And this will be my metrics. So if I'm Netflix, my purpose is being able to stream videos. If I'm Amazon, my purpose is you are able to click and submit the order. If I'm a mobile uh, provider, I don't care maybe if you, if you wanna uh, check your uh, Facebook feed or LinkedIn feed, but what I care about is you're able to make a call. So this is the one metrics that, I, that I'm looking at, and this is the linear KPI that I'm looking at. And then I would look at what will be the minimum that this service could run through without disruption. So in this case, I'm, I'm expecting that 1% of the traffic, of the incoming traffic is good enough to run the service that my customer coming for. And in that thing, I'm taking 2% out of my 100% availability. I'm leaving 98% as normal, behaving as they are. I'm not disrupting that, but I'm documenting in place my KPI. I'm documenting in place what, it, what am I expecting as an output? And those will be my hypothesis. And then I'm taking this minimum that I speak about, 1%. And remember, I said 1%, but we took 2%. Because I will have two things. I will emulate the service control. And, and that would be my controller. So I'm not touching that. This 1%, because this is my fallback plan. And the other 1% is really what I'm experimenting with. So here in that method, what I'm doing in my service A experiment that you see it here down, I'm injecting delays in there. So what happened if the service stuck here and didn't go to, to service B? Will I see an impact on, on users? Will the user still able to get the service? What will happen? So, in, and this is why I'm focused only on one KPI at the time. This is my one metrics that I'm measuring. So for Netflix, this is streaming service. How many time did you log into Netflix? You may missing um, your recommended line. You may missing your uh, frequently, um, viewed video or frequent um, watch or previous watch or recommendation, but you are still able to click that button and play a video. Yes, it's annoying a little bit because I have to scroll down, find the video rather than see it on top of my screen. If you are Amazon, maybe you will not see buy with one click or maybe you will not see um, your saved preference, but you will be able to submit your order. And this is exactly what we're speaking about. And those are life examples because those organizations use exactly that. So in, in my service A experiment, 
I'm injecting delays or I'm dropping the service itself and see how the system will behave. Will my customer still be able to, to click that button and play? Because this is what bring me money. This is really where the value to customer is. And without having that in place, I'm not successful. My business is down. And this is my one metrics that I'm keeping. So I'm running this experience by injecting delays or delaying or stopping the service and see how my whole system behave in that. So if I see a problem or service disruption while I'm monitoring everything else, I cut the experiment short. In some instant, we were, um, we were testing in, um, in, in pre-production in our testing environment. And this, the engineer was confident because we have the same setup in production that nothing will happen. We end up bringing the whole infrastructure which is the internal, not the production, for eight days until we discover where the problem happened. So the ripple effect is enormous. So don't play if you're not ready to play. <coughs> and then we get things to normal. Remember, I have my service control, which keep me safe, which make sure that we still have something going on. So. Um, behind all beauty lies madness and cause. Um, multiple, uh, uh, multiple and unexpected interaction of failure and inevitable. So those are comment from people who run this experience experiment themselves, who had been um, through that journey. So um, what happened if it fails? doesn't really matter because what we really care about, what happened when it fails, because that's what affects our customer. We are more concise. We are more busy with who, what happened if it fails rather than um, what happened when it fails, really. And this is really what I want to discuss with you today. And I'll bring back, as I promised, the, 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 the metrics that we all like and if you compare this metrics to every service that we use today, we don't even expect to be 30 seconds down, uh, no matter what service we are using. We're gonna complain, we may be gonna change the provider if that happens. So uh, with that, I would like to open the floor for questions and discussion. Um, if you wanna, if anything that's not clear and you wanna clarify more, I'm more than happy to elaborate on.